This is Gerhard, engineer on the Core RDMQ team and the mastermind behind many of the things we are going to talk about. And I would like to introduce Michal. He's the um, RabbitMQ for Kubernetes PM. So if you have any Kubernetes questions, he's the person to ask. The one thing which I would disagree with you, Michal, on that previous note is that Michal is the mastermind behind this <laughs> because he gave me the idea of Prometheus and I took it really far. <laughs> so a couple of years after that thing happened, this thing is happening now, which I'm very excited about. And Michal will uh, do an intro and then I'll follow up with uh, the rest. Thank you. Um, you. We have a lot of uh, slides um, that are graphs or dashboards or uh, basically may be hard to see on a relatively small screen here. So if you want, you can go to gerhard.io and uh, this, uh, that, uh, this presentation is available there so that you can look at your laptop if you prefer. All right, so what was the problem with the previous solution? Well, until now, basically the management plugin is the de facto tool to manage and monitor RabbitMQ. Unfortunately, it relies on uh, it, it runs on the same Erlang infrastructure together with RabbitMQ, and therefore is so tightly coupled that if you have a problem in your Rabbit, then the management plugin probably has a problem as well. Uh, for example, here is a well-known dashboard, and we are trying to reload the page on a heavy D. Uh, loaded cluster. It takes roughly a minute just to load the page, right? That's obviously not good enough. You cannot debug a system like that. What's worse, um, each node is responsible for storing uh, its historical metrics, which means if you restart a node, you lose that history. If you restore the whole cluster to solve a problem, you basically can no longer perform a post-mortem because you just deleted all evidence. Um, you can use an external system to monitor RabbitMQ, and you will solve the historical data problem, but the performance issue will probably be still there because pretty much every external system we rely on the management API to, get, to collect the metrics. So the performance issue is still there. Right? After a minute, finally, we see something. Well, we actually don't see because this screen resolution issues. <laughs> um, so the management plugin provides the UI as well as API to collect the metrics. And here, for example, we measured how long it takes uh, to query RabbitMQ Exporter, which is an, a community plugin that adds Prometheus support, but relies on the management plugin to, to collect the metrics. As you can see in this example, 36 seconds just to collect the metrics, right? That's, that's not good enough. You can only collect the metrics like once a minute in this scenario. Even though if you look at, at the minimum time, it's just 82 milliseconds, right? If the cluster is not busy, it's actually very fast. And just to be clear, the problem here is not the exporter, the, ex the community plugin, the problem here is the management plugin that actually needs to return the metrics. So in 3.8, we have a completely new Prometheus support um, provided as a built-in plugin. And all you have to do to get started is, this is all wrong, sorry. Okay. You need to obviously upgrade to 3.8. You need to enable that plugin. Um, that will add a new listener. You can see that Prometheus exporter at the end. And that will give you an endpoint that Prometheus can scrape to collect the metrics. So how does it compare in terms of performance? This is the same cluster at the same time. You can see, still see the 36 seconds time for the exporter for the community one and just 300 milliseconds for this new exporter, uh, which is obviously much, much better. An important note though is that the old, the management plugin provides you a single, a, a single endpoint to collect the metrics for all nodes and the whole cluster. With this new plugin, you need to scrape the metrics from each node individually, which is a good thing, but you just need to remember about that. That's why we see three different lines here. So now that we have a new reliable source of data, we also needed a new way to visualize that data. And for that, Grafana is the perfect tool for the job. Um, there's this RabbitMQ overview. So we created a bunch of dashboards that you can just import. And this is the RabbitMQ overview 
dashboard, which roughly shows the same data you would see in the management UI. But you also get the whole power of Grafana and Prometheus. You can customize this dashboard, you can add your own graphs, you can set thresholds, you can define alerts, and so on. Because we collect all metrics on a per node basis, it's easy, very easy to spot imbalances within the cluster. For example, this graph shows the number of queue masters per node. As you can see, there are 10 on node zero and no masters on the other two nodes. It is actually a very common problem because by default, when you declare a queue, the node you're connected to becomes the master. So if you have one client declaring the whole topology, you will often end up in a situation like that. There are some workarounds, um, but even if initially you avoid this issue, after a rolling upgrade or some other maintenance operations on the cluster, you may end up in a situation like that. For this, we now have a new command, which you can just execute on any of the nodes to rebalance and reshuffle the master, um, the queue masters between the nodes. If you look carefully, you can spot the moment where we executed this command on this cluster. All right, but Redbeam Q relies on Erlang for clustering and uh, communication between the nodes. So to really understand what's going on, you also need to monitor Erlang. This dashboard is exclusively focused on Erlang distribution. For example, you can see whether the, no, uh, the links between the nodes are healthy. You can see how much data is being transferred between each pair of nodes and much, much more. For example, here we can see data in the port driver buffer, which likely doesn't tell you much. But first of all, having graphs like that, if you see a spike like that around the time you had an issue, it's probably worth investigating. Maybe it's not the cause, maybe it's a syndrome, but it's certainly worth understanding what happened here. And this particular metric is actually very important and something that we didn't expose previously. This is the amount of data that in this case is waiting on node zero to be transferred to node two. So if there's any new message, any new uh, piece of data to be transferred between these nodes, 120 megabytes of data has to be transferred between these nodes over the network before that happens, right? So you cannot expect low latency at this point. So this is a very important metric. So you could say now that we have rabbit metrics or Erlang metrics, that's all we need, right? Well, we are still missing the most important part what the application can actually see, right? Users don't complain about data in the Erlang buffers, they complain about the applications being slow. So here we have a dashboard showing the latency and throughput for PerfTest, which is our internal application that we use for testing. You should basically instrument your own applications like that, which, not, which is not that hard. Um, it's actually relatively easy. But even, even if you don't have that instrumentation, you can still deploy perf test to compare the numbers that your users or developers are reporting. If they say, I can only, I don't know, produce a thousand messages a second, you can deploy perf test and see uh, whether that's the problem, whether it's a problem with the cluster or maybe with the application, with the client. With so much data, sooner or later, you will see a piece of data that you don't understand. There will be a graph that has some weird spikes or you know, weird curve, and you would like to understand what's going on. Uh, and therefore, for many of the graphs, you will see this eye icon that provides additional explanation of what this metric actually means. And it will link you to the relevant parts of the documentation. If that's not good enough, if you still have a problem, you still don't understand, you still can't solve the issue, Grafana has a great feature which allows you to share a snapshot of your dashboard. So instead of taking a screenshot that we need to then work with, you can actually expose a subset of your monitoring data to someone on the mailing list or with Pivotal, and then we can actually work with the data and not a screenshot of a dashboard. All right, so first of all, upgrade to 3.8, there are many amazing features waiting for you. Uh, it's technically even possible to run the management UI without the metrics subsystem. Um, it's not a very beautiful dashboard when you do that, but we will deal with that later. Um, please enable and visualize these metrics. 
that's the first step towards having factual data-driven conversations in the future. And when you ask for help, please help us help you and share these metrics so that we can actually understand what's going on. And with that, I will hand over to Gerhard, who will show us even more awesomeness. Thank you for that uh, introduction and for warming the room up. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. So um, we talked about the limitations in the existing RabbitMQ or in the previous RabbitMQ versions. Uh, we also heard uh, about the new metric system in uh, RabbitMQ 3.8, uh, but all of this would be for nothing if there wasn't a higher goal, right? We're, just, we're not trying to show off here. We're not trying to play with colors. We're trying to understand something. We're trying you to understand something and to have different conversations. So one of the things that uh, keeps coming up or has been coming up over the years that I've been in the RabbitMQ community was uh, what is happening when we're using mirrored queues? What is happening at a cluster level? What happens between the nodes? Um, also, this is something which keeps coming up is what's happening with the quorum queues. How are they different? Can you tell us, can you show us the benefits? And there is one very obvious benefit which I'll show you in the next couple of minutes. So this is a typical mirrored classic queue. Uh, it has one master and two mirrors. This runs in a three node cluster and we're publishing 100 messages per second. Not high throughput, something fairly standard. The messages themselves had, have 10 kibi bytes, and this is important, and one publisher, one consumer, so very simple setup, I would say. The thing to remember here is that there is a constant message flow, so we publish and consume messages constantly, and the throughput, both in and out, is one maybe byte per second. So, you're used to seeing this, the RabbitMQ management. You can see, okay, I can see my rate. Unfortunately, this is slightly cropped. Um, we can see at the bottom the details uh, where we see that um, the master is running on RabbitMQ 0, the first slave is running on RabbitMQ 2, and the second slave is running on RabbitMQ 1. We can't see it on this slide, but trust me, that's what's happening. You can check this online uh, to see it. Um, so. You've already seen this dashboard. This is the Erlang distribution dashboard that shows you what is happening from an Erlang perspective. Low level, all communication goes via the Erlang distribution. This is a view into the Erlang distribution. The thing which I would like to point out here is that these will show you the state of the various links between nodes. And everything here looks healthy. All the links are up. There are six links. A RabbitMQ cluster is a complete graph which means that every node connects to every other node. So because we have three nodes, we'll have, three link. We'll have, we'll have six links. But the thing which I would like to point out in this graph, other than that, and if you could see the top, is the data sent to peer nodes. So remember, we have one megabyte coming in and one megabyte going out. But what's happening at a cluster level, RabbitMQ0 is sending two megabytes to RabbitMQ2, which is the first slave, RabbitMQ1, is sending one megabyte to RabbitMQ0, and RabbitMQ2 is sending one megabyte to RabbitMQ1. Also, RabbitMQ0 is also sending one megabyte to RabbitMQ1. So what's all this traffic? Where is all this traffic coming from? So we have the master mirror, two megabytes, mirror one to mirror two, one megabyte, mirror two to master zero, which completes the ring, and this is the chain replication, you can see the effects of the chain replication from a network perspective. And we can also see that master zero is publishing messages to mirror two. The reason why this happens is because not only your messages will be going around the cluster, you'll also have the channel which will publish the same messages into the mirrors. And the reason why this happens is you need to publish messages twice in this case, because if something fails, you have another copy of the message around. So what that means is that for the one megabyte coming in, for the one megabyte going out, you have five megabytes going around the cluster. That's a lot of data, okay? Why does this matter? I mean, I just told this number, but why does this matter? The reason why this matter matters is because there is an absolute limit that the single Erlang distribution link can push. And this limit for 10 kilobyte payloads is actually 470 megabytes per second. Okay, so this is the absolute limit that a single link can publish, and this is OTP 22. 
So if you're using a previous version, it won't be better. If you're using a next version, now that's interesting. So we showed that graph that you've seen before to the OTP team, to the Erlang team, and we told them, hey, we've discovered this. What do you think about this? And they said, well, we knew there was a problem, but we didn't expect people to think or come across this limit. It's just basically how much data we copy around. And the way we copy data is not as efficient as it could be. Six hours later, Ricard Green did a PR which improves this. So that one graph helped the OTP team improve certain things in Erlang OTP itself, in the, in the distribution itself, and how data is copied and transferred around. So this limit is now higher. Quorum queues, right? We've heard a lot about quorum queues. How are the quorum queues different from classic queues, from the mirrored classic queues? Same setup, same thing happening in the cluster. This is the difference. The difference is that we have only one megabyte going from the leader to one follower and from the same leader to another follower. That's it. So in summary, the quorum queue is putting 2.5x less pressure on the Erlang distribution because of the much better algorithm. The replication algorithm that quorum queues use is so much better. And this is one way in which we can see that from a network perspective, you will be transferring less between nodes using quorum queues doing exactly the same thing that mirrored classic queues are doing. So we've seen the Erlang distribution. Maybe it was a bit more than you wanted to see, a bit too deep dive-ish, but that's okay. Now we'll look at the RabbitMQ quorum queues, the internals. And again, to most of you, this may not mean a lot now, but as you start using them, I think that you will want to know what's happening under the hood. And maybe someone in your team will have experience with Raft or Erlang or different things that can see this and they can say, oh, hang on, actually, I can, I can tell you what's going on. So we can see the log entries that are being committed. We've heard about Carl talk about the log. We've heard how that works. Here we can see how many log entries are being committed per second. We can see a nice explanation of what that means and what is good and what is bad. So you can have a real-time view into the log operations on a node-by-node -node basis. If a node lags behind or if a, node, nodes it, if a node, is, node is ahead, it's good to know. Not only that, but another thing which again will come up, we were, low latency was mentioned. So how long does it take for a log operation to be written to disk? This is it. We can see roughly a distribution of the log as being written to disk and how long they take. Um, with also the explanation. And here at the bottom, we can see something very interesting. I won't cover all the dashboards, but here we can see uh, members which have logs and how they get truncated. So we can see like those, those lines going up and down. But we can also see here a member for which the log operations keep going up. And this is something worth watching out for because eventually you will hit the limit. So in this case, maybe there's no consumers, right? And you have log operations being appended or maybe you can have a consumer which keeps rejecting messages.